Good morning. My name is Sean Roach. I am the Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at S&P Global Ratings, and I'm talking to you from Singapore. I only wish I could be in Seoul and be with you personally. Many thanks to the Institute for Global Economics for inviting me to speak at the summit. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So today I'm going to talk about three COVID legacies for Asia Pacific that uh, we think are especially important and interesting. But first, a little bit of context. I think while the world is suffering from one of the deepest shocks we've ever seen, perhaps the deepest shock the global economy has seen certainly since uh, the 19th century, we should put in context that Asia Pacific, all things considered, is doing a tremendous job both on the health front, where infection curves have been flattened rather effectively in most economies, and in economic terms, where Asia Pacific, not only among the major regions, will shrink least this year, but will rebound fastest in 2021. But still, there are some legacies that we should talk about. The first one that I'd like to bring up is shell-shocked consumers. I think one thing that we've seen in Asia Pacific that distinguishes the region perhaps from others is the extent to which the rebound in consumer spending has been weaker than we've seen elsewhere. Uh, the chart that you can see here on this slide, which is a heat map of retail sales growth over recent months in Asia Pacific, Europe and the United States shows that in many cases, in major Asian economies, retail sales growth has been relatively weak, especially given the overall growth numbers that we've seen. There's been very little evidence of pent up demand in consumer spending, something that we have seen in both Europe and the US. I draw your attention to China, which is especially interesting. Uh, this is an economy that's clearly outperforming the global average. And yet retail sales growth only turned positive in August and even in September was well below the 8% trend level that we were used to before COVID. So what's going on? Three things to think about, I think. The first would be perhaps fiscal policy. Is fiscal policy in Asia Pacific having a hard time reaching households? We know in Europe, the US and Australia, Fiscal policy has been directly targeted at disposable income of households, and that has helped to support spending. In many cases in Asia, that has not happened as effectively. Again, China's a very good example here. Lots of fiscal policy stimulus, but we've seen very little of it go directly into the pockets of households. Secondly, dual labor markets. So while the rise in unemployment rates do not appear to have been very large in Asia, what we do know is that almost all of the job losses in economies such as Japan, Korea, even Australia, have come in the part-time and temporary area of the labor market. And this is where much of the jobs growth has been over recent years. So if you have a regular job with good benefits, you're likely to have held onto that job. But if you're part-time temporary with no benefits, uh, there's a good chance that you may have lost your job. I think this is creating con conditions where consumers are very cautious, they're holding high levels of saving, and when a shock hits, they tend to save even more. A lot of the jobs growth has been in these low quality, uh, insecure jobs, and that's creating a problem, I think, for household confidence. And thirdly, aging societies. Of course, as you're uh, approaching retirement, and you start to see these shocks emerge, it may encourage you to hold more saving uh, just in case you do lose your job and you find it difficult to get another one. So I think aging societies, again, another reason why we might be seeing this consumption rebound a little bit slower in Asia than we've seen in other parts of the world, particularly Australia and the US. Uh, the second COVID legacy I think I'd like to talk about is uh, policy space and the fact that we have learned that the world and Asia has much more policy space than we thought before the crisis. And uh, using that policy space has been effective. Now, of course, it helps that the rest of the world has been easing policies at the same time. It would be uh, 
difficult to believe that Korea would have had much policy space if it decided to rapidly ease monetary and fiscal policies when the rest of the world wasn't doing it. The fact that the Fed and the ECB and the BOJ have all either eased policy aggressively or kept policy very accommodative does provide space for other economies. But still, it has allowed uh, governments and central banks to do much more, I think, than people thought was possible before COVID. And what we're learning is that policy response has provided quite an effective cushion for growth in many economies and provided that bridge to the recovery uh, that has been, I think, particularly effective across Asia Pacific, including in Korea. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, is the turn for China towards technology independence. Now, this isn't purely a COVID-19 legacy. This is, we think, a strategic response by China to more complicated geopolitics. But COVID-19 has definitely fed in to that more difficult geopolitical world. This is a global game changer, we think. And it does mean that large parts of China's digital economy are going to be more difficult to access for foreign firms. The other aspect, of course, of self-reliance and technology independence is this concept of dual circulation that China has spoken about. Here we have a domestic circulation part of the economy where domestic supply is meeting the increasingly sophisticated needs of domestic demand. And then we have a part of the economy which plugs into the global system, whether it's global supply chains or foreign firms selling into China or Chinese firms going out. And China's government has told us that both of these cycles will be mutually reinforcing. They're not going to be closed to each other. And in fact, we don't believe that opening up will stop. Opening up will continue in many areas of the economy. But it's clear that the technology sector has become strategic for China. They used those very words in the recent fifth plenum meeting. This is important. In 2006, uh, pre-digital economy, uh, the agency that manages China's state-owned enterprises identified seven strategic industries and noted that each of those industries should be subject to full control of the state. Now, that's unlikely to happen now because large parts of the digital economy are already occupied by private firms, particularly private domestic firms. So the model will be different. But it looks likely that the state will be heavily involved in the digital economy and the space for foreign firms in many parts of this industry is going to be somewhat more limited. Now, of course, there are many ways an economy like China can choose a development path. There is no right or wrong answer. But we do think that this move towards technology independence and self-reliance will have a cost on growth. I think the evidence both for China and other economies is that the more open you are, the faster that you grow. You're open to new ideas, new investment, and the competition you get uh, from both exports and imports. In fact, we think that uh, this turn towards technology independence will put downward pressure on uh, China's productivity growth over the next 10 to 15 years. China will still remain an exceptional performer, but it will become more average over time. You could see that on this chart here, where we show our projection for China's growth rate through 2035. We expect over the next 10 years through 2030, for average growth to be about 4.6%, which sounds quite low, but it's easy to get there with just a modest decline in productivity growth, which we expect, and of course, uh, a shrinking workforce. So, let me leave it there. Three COVID legacies, I think, for people to think about. One, why is the consumer underperforming in Asia relative to other economies in the world? Two, this crisis has shown we have more policy space than we thought, and it's proven effective. Does that mean we have more policy space going forward? And thirdly, China's turn towards technology independence. This is a global game changer and will change the rules of the game for foreign companies in China's economy. I hope you enjoyed my remarks and I look forward to answering your questions and engaging in the discussion. Thank you.